So good afternoon, my name is Amanda Jarvis and I'm with the Virginia Small Business Development Center Network. For those of you that are not familiar with our organization, the Virginia Small Business Development Center is a partnership program between the US Small Business Administration, George Mason University and local host institutions throughout Virginia. With 27 locations across the Commonwealth, we provide training and technical assistance to small businesses in their local communities. Our one-on-one -on -one consulting services are available at no charge. Today's webinar, Fundamental Cybersecurity, Protecting Your Business Information, is presented by the Virginia SBDC Network in collaboration with the Virgin Islands SBDC Network. I am joined here today by Mary Jo Williams and Sharika Industrious Phillips from the Virgin Islands SBDC. And here's a quick introduction to the Virgin Islands SBDC. Has your business been affected by COVID-19? The Virgin Islands Small Business Development Center is available to assist entrepreneurs and small businesses in the U.S. Virgin Islands. The VISBDC is sustained by the University of the Virgin Islands and the U.S. Small Business Administration and collaborates with local agencies to support the small business community. The VISBDC is nationally accredited and provides free consulting, business education training, and technical assistance. Attend workshops with subject matter experts from both the public and private sector. From idea generation to exit strategies, the staff at the VISBDC is ready to assist you. Now is the time to contact them, so don't wait. Call or email them to find out how they can help your business grow and succeed. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our presenter for today's session. Tom has over 25 years of cybersecurity experience and began his career in the U.S. Army Signal Corps before transitioning to the military intelligence as a counterintelligence agent with assignments in Germany, the U.S., and Middle East. Tom served his country honorably in both Operation Desert Shield and Desert Storm and Operation Iraqi Freedom. Tom is certified as an information system security professional and information security manager and is certified in risk and information systems control. Since arriving in Winchester in 2018, Tom started his cybersecurity firm specializing in helping small and medium businesses protect their critical and sensitive digital information and was recently awarded top of Virginia's Regional Chamber of Commerce's 2021 Entrepreneur of the Year. Tom joined the Virginia Small Business Development Center in October 2020 to work as a cybersecurity counselor providing cybersecurity insight and strategies to business owners. Please join me in welcoming our presenter for today, Tom Stimulus. Thank you, Amanda. And thank you everybody for joining. Uh, today, we're gonna be talking about um, fundamentals of cybersecurity. And, and I really don't like the word cybersecurity because it can mean so many different things to individuals. So what we really wanna do is we wanna kind of simplify the elements that make that up and, and how does it apply to small businesses? Uh, a, there's a lot of similarities between a small and medium business with a large enterprise, but normally, uh, you know, we realize that our small and medium businesses don't necessarily have either the budget or the resources or uh, the personnel to, to tackle the issue the same way that a large enterprise would. So we have some really unique challenges. Uh, we're going to go through this. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the, um, in the chat box. Uh, or in the question and answer section, uh, we'll make sure that we get to them before the uh, the end of the event. So uh, first thing is, like I said, just, uh, you know, why should you listen to me? Uh, I always, you know, when I go to listen to somebody, I do have a lot of experience in cybersecurity. I, as I said, I started in the United States Army as a counterintelligence agent and then moved uh, purely into cybersecurity while I was still with the military. And then after leaving the military, I've been a consultant ever since. Uh, and I've had the opportunity to work with these really large firms. And the beauty of that is, is that every engagement was different. Um, every, I could work with different industries. I worked with different size organizations. I had different requirements, whether it meant it was an audit or a policy review or helping them structure their environment. And it allowed me to develop the skills that I can now share with our business owners, uh, you know, in the Virginia area as well. So uh, that's just, you know, like I said, I, I, I enjoy the, the, the issue. Uh, 
been doing it for a long time. It's evolved. Some areas we've gotten really better at. Some areas we've gotten worse at. And uh, so I think it's something that constantly changes, which really makes my uh, my job exciting. It's never going to get boring because there's always something new that we have to learn. So today's agenda, I want to talk a little bit about some, you know, small businesses and why it's important. Uh, an overview of cybersecurity. Uh, I like going through a thing that myth versus reality because there's a lot of information that's put out by the mass media, the general media, that's, that's just wrong. Uh, and I want to make sure that we address that. Uh, what are some of the attackers that we're dealing with? You know, what do they want? You know, why uh, is it important to you uh, to understand what they want? Uh, assessing your risk. And then lastly, we're going to leave you with 10 steps to that you can basically start with today to provide yourself and your organization better security. So these are really, you know, the facts are is that, you know, 84% of our small businesses use some form of digital technology to provide information to their customers. That could be a website, social media, uh, email, uh, lists, you know, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, newsletters, we're using something that allows us to reach out to our customers because traditional media uh, just isn't as effective and it's also exclusionary. Uh, it costs a lot of money to put uh, ads on the radio. It costs even more money to put ads on television. And if you think about it, those media uh, methods were really uh, limited to wealthy organizations. Now you can be a single person startup with a very small budget and you can still build your brand uh, by using Instagram or Facebook or LinkedIn or anything like that. Um, and also, like I said, you know, 80% are using a digital platform to communicate. So we're all using email. Uh, we're all using, you know, we could be using Twitter. We could be using like constant contacts to get out to our IT clients. Um, you know, interesting, if you look here, you know, in 2019, only 50% of small businesses had a website, and that became painfully evident uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. There were a lot of organizations that wanted to pivot, couldn't, because they didn't even have uh, a digital presence in the form of a website. Uh, that changed, of course, but, you know, now we're probably about 80 to 85% of small businesses have some type of website, something you can build quickly with Wix or WordPress to get it up. It really just gives your clients an ability to find you on the internet, uh, learn about you uh, at their convenience. And that's really what a website allows them to do. They don't have to call us between nine and five. They don't have to worry about us picking up the phone if we're busy. We can put as much information as we want out there. So we have this information that we need to protect. So just a little understanding, if you look, Cybersecurity is not that old, okay? We're talking 30 years. Uh, and, and, you know, and, that's, and think of how much it's changed since the 70s. I mean, if you think about it, the internet really didn't take up until 1999, all right? Um, and that was, you know, 1998, 99, that's when things started. People realized they could monetize it. So for the first 20 years, it was more of a communication method, you know, uh, it, uh, schools and universities would use it to share and as but as time went on you know people became curious about and a lot of the the vulnerabilities that were identified initially were identified by scientists or, or you know computer science individuals because they wanted to try something you know and things would happen by accident and then when we realized that we could start monetizing the, uh, the, the internet, all right, when you have like AOL and Netscape and things like that, that's when criminals realize it's a new platform. It's a new way to either exploit something, to either steal something or to gain information that we couldn't get generally or people didn't want to share. And they really looked for those vulnerabilities to exploit it. Then you had individuals that just did it for malicious reasons. Uh, and now you have a, a whole slew of individuals that are potentially or could potentially cause problems on the internet. And some of us, we could be victims directly of it or we could be indirect victims of it. But the biggest thing to understand is no matter what you do, if you own an organization, you own a business and you're on the internet, you have to address cybersecurity. Right. It, it's not going anywhere. It's going to get progressively more. Um, the challenge is, you know, 
is that really cybercrime, you know, and this is from that chairman of IBM, that cybercrime is the greatest threat to every company in the world. So whether you're a solopreneur or whether you have 100,000 employees, cybercrime can impact and potentially devastate our businesses. And what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about how to lessen that effect on us. Now, are we as desirable as a large enterprise? No. But the beauty and the danger of the internet is it doesn't have to be regional. So you could be, you can live in a very safe environment, right? Safe town, safe county, safe state. That's not the crime that we're dealing with. We're dealing with crime that can affect us from anywhere in the world, any country, any continent, all right, that if they are connected to the internet and you are connected to the internet, you are a potential target. So that expands it from whatever, you know, several thousand potential criminals to 7 billion potential criminals, if you really want to look at it, and if they're all on the internet, and we have a vulnerability that they can identify, they could exploit it and take advantage of it, and not even be in the same country as us, right? Not even on the same continent. And that happens a lot when you think about like Russian attackers, you know, uh, attackers from China or Pacific or Africa or South America, really doesn't matter. They can reach us at any time, uh, not even during our work hours. So it's really something that we really just have to put things in place to make us less desirable to a potential attacker. So let's go over some of these little myths that we that sometimes are propagated by mass media. All right. So the first thing is, is, you know, you've never had a cyber attack. So your security is obviously strong enough. All right. That's not true. Cyber threats evolve and they are constantly evolving because as a cyber threat is identified, it's uh, addressed, it's fixed. They move on to find another vulnerability. Um, the when you have an application that application could be potentially secure but they create a service pack update to provide more features unfortunately they aren't always tested in the manner that they're supposed to so they implement that new service pack you get some great new features but unknowingly they re, uh, eliminated a security parameter or changed the security parameter which created a vulnerability so it's constantly so Basically, it's every day you leave your house, right? Um, you have certain, you, you, when you leave, I don't know about you, but when I leave my house and I lock my door, I grab the handle and I check the door to make sure it's locked. That's basically cybersecurity. I could just lock the door, right? And say it's locked. But sometimes we all know, sometimes mechanical failures happen. Sometimes the bolt doesn't engage. Maybe the door is slightly ajar. I think it's, uh, I think it's locked, but it's not. So I always do that check. That's really what we have to do because systems, things change. Uh, cyber criminals don't care about small and medium businesses. We make up about 54% of our gross domestic product in the United States. We're the largest enterprise in the United States. There's no enterprise that's bigger than small and medium businesses, okay? We employ more people than any, uh, than any enterprise or any industry. Uh, we provide more tax dollars than any enterprise or industry. It's just that we do it in smaller chunks. But as I said, the internet opens it up where I can, Yes. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but someone is saying that the the screen presentation is off to the right. Um, I guess there's an issue with. I'm not really sure. I it looks good on my end. Um, I don't know if anybody else is having this issue. Um, this is because I've got it set up. Let us know. It looks good to me, but I I, I don't know. Stop sharing. I'll start again. Yeah, maybe just restart. It looks good. Okay, so it might be. Um, okay, it's good on some people, so it could be on your end, maybe. Um, yeah, the person who, who let me know that. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just well, that's okay. No, I'm glad you caught that. Thank you. Yeah, the, okay, uh, so I think it might be something where you need to move your screen around, um, Samuel. So just try maybe try like maximizing. Okay, we're all good. Okay, continue. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, so you know, uh, all of our money spends the same. 
And that's something that, you know, whether it's a hundred dollars, a thousand dollars or $10,000. Uh, and because the, these criminals try to exploit uh, simple vulnerabilities, it takes no time for them, it takes less time in reality to go after a small business than it does for a larger enterprise. Now, maybe the prize is bigger with a larger enterprise, but the risk of getting caught, uh, the risk of being prosecuted, the risk of being discovered, all of that goes up as well because, of course, they're going to have more security. There's a lot of our small businesses that don't have the proper security in place, and that puts them at risk and they could potentially get into our organization, steal our information, steal our clients, steal our money um, without us necessarily knowing or having the proper recourse to get it back. Um, if you're in an industry that requires compliance of some sort, a lot of people feel, well, you know, I the auditor came in and I passed my compliance. Remember that compliance is the lowest level of, of requirements, all right? so. They, a typical example is, you know, there's a lot of regulatory organizations that will ask you, do you have a firewall? And the answer is, yes, I have a firewall. Well, that's called test of design. Test of effectiveness would be, is it installed? Uh, is it on? Uh, have you uh, put in firewall rules? And if the answer is no, no, and no, well, you answered the question there. So yes, you essentially have a firewall, but you didn't tell them that's sitting in your box next to the desk because you haven't had time to install it. Or you installed it, but it wasn't working correctly, so you bypassed it, right? That happens a lot, all right? So when we look at compliance, remember it may, you know, just because you're compliant does not mean that you've reduced your overall risk. Um, antivirus, any malware is enough. It was, it's not anymore. Now it's just a layer uh, that we use on our endpoints, maybe our exchange servers or even our websites, but it's not enough because, you know, uh, malware has become very adaptive and it's constantly changing and antivirus and anti-malware are created once someone identifies what that virus or malware is. It's not proactive, it's reactive. Um, so that's another thing that we got to keep in mind. So it's definitely not enough on its, on its own. Cybersecurity belongs to the IT, all right? So first thing is IT owns nothing in your organization. IT is merely a steward, all right, that is put in place to ensure that the business owners and that the people who work for those business owners can access the information they knew, need to do their job. So HR owns the HR information. Uh, uh, the CFO owns all the financial information. The chief information security officer, I mean, chief information officer, the IT director, they do not own that information. So it's not their job to, uh, it's not only their job to protect that information. They don't determine who gets access to the financial information. The financial owner does. So therefore, it's a joint relationship. What the IT department does, their number one job, of course, is to keep the network up so that the organization can access the data that they need to do, that they need to access to provide the service or create the product or whatever your job or whatever your company does, that's what the IT department does. They're responsible for keeping the equipment up. Now, inherently, just like if they were the building supervisor, there is security related to managing a building. You don't just keep the air conditioning on and the heat and the water running, right? You're responsible for the external access to the doors. Uh, you, you know, whatever. You're responsible for certain physical security. But if you think about it, that card key badge or access card that they give you when you get to that new job, that, that's your responsibility to protect that card key. It's not the building owner. It's not the security person who issued that car key, it's your responsibility. So it's a joint relationship and IT can only do so much. We all have shortages in our organization and you know, think about it, IT could be in the middle of the most important security upgrade known to man and if the email goes down, the CEO will make that the priority. All right, because their salespeople can't contact their customers, their customers can't contact uh, customer care, they can't 
you know, so the communication within an organization really is the most important, regardless of what the security, because the CEO doesn't care, because they care more about the fact that they have to keep the company running. I'm not saying they have to, they don't care at all. The priorities change. So it's important that we are working together. That's why we do security awareness, because it's kind of like a network marketing. The more people we educate to understand what spam is or what uh, ransomware is or what phishing is, then it helps the IT department focus on the bigger rocks of security. And they have an entire army of people with some understanding to know what they should and what they shouldn't click on. So it reduces that threat uh, or that attack footprint, if that's what you want to really call it. Because now I have smarter people, more aware people working in my organization. I'm going to have less mistakes. Still going to have mistakes. It happens. But overall, we're going to have less mistakes. You'll know if you're immediately, if your company's breached. That's no. Even big companies. Um, if you think about it, a breach can occur. And of course, the number one thing about a breach is you don't want to be detected. So they take serious steps to remain undetected by the organization. That could be a week, a month, could be a year. Now, if a large organization can't detect for a year, and once they do detect it, they don't report it immediately because they go through their forensics and they bring in the specialists and then they report it. And then nine out of 10 times, they report it incorrectly. Then, but down the road, another three months, they'll say, geez, it wasn't a million. It was actually 10 million accounts, all right? We've seen it across the board. They never want to come out with the information first because you've got legal talking about damage control and people are worried about stock prices and all that other stuff, right? They don't really care about your data or your user account and your password. They care about a lot of other extraneous things. And so it could be take a year and a half before you really know the result. As a small company, maybe if they take money, you're going to see it quicker. But if they're just in there and they're using your organization for some other nefarious means, you may not know. And you may not even detect it. It might be a customer. It might be the FBI. It might be local authorities to say, hey, we found this document on the web. We believe this belongs to you. Is it, you know, it's not supposed to be out in public. And you find out that you've been breached. Um, complete cybersecurity can be cheap. That's a no. It's an ongoing uh, process, all right? It's not a sprint. You know, people say it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. Really, really, it's a lifestyle, okay? You either adopt uh, security practices into your organization and regularly assess them and manage them and change them based off of the threat posture that you're dealing with, or you end up getting breached. So you really have to evolve. It's no different than, you know, walking through a city where you know you, you go from neighborhood to neighborhood. Some neighborhoods are very safe, some neighborhoods are not so safe, and some neighborhoods are just downright dangerous. And you have to uh, adapt your either your route or how you walk or where you walk or when you walk uh, based off of the threat environment that you're surrounded by. And lastly here, you know, threats come from outside of your organization. That is true, but unfortunately, uh, insider threats are really a difficult thing because we've vetted these individuals. We've hired these individuals, but something has changed. Maybe they didn't get the promotion that they wanted or that they felt that they deserved. Maybe they didn't deserve it, but they believe they deserve it. And instead of taking the, the, uh, the information and trying to get better, they're angry, all right? And they feel hurt, they feel slighted. They feel like that you don't appreciate them and they want vengeance or they want to make money because they didn't get the raise that they wanted. So they will use their existing access, right? Which is far more than uh, a stranger to potentially you know, get access to your entire sales list. Uh, or maybe proprietary information or that, you know, that's yours, you know, or intellectual property or financial information, all right? There's the, you know, an insider can cause significant damage. So that's why it's really good to understand your individuals and, and, and educate your people what to look for. If someone, you know, this someone, you know, when you're, some people don't get a, a promotion or a raise, they're upset and they voice it, but they, not many will take 
the advice of how can I get better? What can I do to get the, the promotion next time or get the raise next time? And they will build upon that and they'll take that constructive criticism and move forward. Some don't. And we need to be aware of those individuals that can't take that or won't take that constructive criticism because it doesn't just hurt the company. It hurts all of us in the company. So here's just a list of a bunch of different types of attackers, right? Recreational script kiddies. A script kitty is really a person or an individual that has no real skills. They know how to hit enter. They know how to, they, they hang out on the dark web. They hang out with the cool kids, all right? And they get an application that can do X, right? And they follow the directions. It comes with a manual and they just follow the directions. They, they really don't have a lot of skills. They're very easily detectable. And those are the ones we don't have to worry about. What we really need to focus on, and then on the other side, you get state-sponsored attackers. That's like China going after the US, the US, you know, Israel going after uh, the Russians, the Russians going after the United States, US going after, that's state-sponsored. It's highly technical, highly funded, well-resourced, and they're going after each individual. Countries are going after countries, okay? Um, another area we don't really need to be concerned with unless we're, uh, like, you know, if a state-sponsored attack tried to take down an electrical grid or something like that, that affects us indirectly, but we're never, most likely never going to be a target of it. We talked about insider threats. So the ones we really have to worry about is cybercrime, tribal criminals, organized crime, hackers, and hacktivists. Cyber criminals and organized crime, it's all for the profit, all right? They are looking to make money off of an exploit or a way off the internet, whether that be ransomware to, you know, hold your information hostage to you pay a fine or pay a fee. Uh, hackers are going in, they're looking for information, they're looking for usernames and passwords, credit cards, things like that. And then the hacktivists is if you're in an industry that, People don't like, all right. You can be targeted, uh, you know, by, you know, you know, you you see, uh, and I'm not going to say they're hacktivists, but if some like Greenpeace or PETA, there are extreme versions that are associated with that that may not like your industry, and they may use their technical skills to cause harm to your industry, all right? I'm not saying PETA or Greenpeace are hacktivists, but I'm saying in every organization is always an extremist level that align with someone. They may not even be uh, uh, recognized by that organization, but they just don't like the mistreatment of animals to the point where they are going to use their skills to cause harm to that organization that they believe or does cause harm to animals. So that's another one that's, that's it's motivated by a cause, not by necessarily financial gain. So we talked about what do they want, all right? And here's really the key stuff that they want. Protected health information, very valuable uh, because it has all of our secrets, all right? Um, payment card information, your credit card information, you know, your, your CCV, uh, you know, they want that. So if you are not outsourcing it and you are processing your credit cards by yourself because you feel you can save some money uh, or it's not that big of a deal, you have to comply with a lot of regulations. Where the challenge comes in is unless you process a certain number of transactions per year, then you don't have an external auditor you kind of self audit and self regulate. So you answer a question, are you using encryption? And you say, yes, if you're not, and you get breached, they could potentially pull your ability to use credit cards forever. Now, if you are in an online store and you have to take cash from, because you failed to answer their, to do what you were supposed to do, that's probably gonna destroy your business. So it's important that if you are dealing with payment card information, that you protect it correctly or you outsource it to a reputable organization that can process it. And then they adopt the requirements because really, you're really just a pass through. It's going from your point of sale device to the processor and then to the banks and things like that. Uh, personally identifiable information everything that you have for a client or a customer, uh, phone, anything that ties them together. So if you just have an email and a name, that's not PII. If you have an email, an address, social security number, phone number, 
uh, all of that, you know, all of that information together, that now becomes PII and you actually have to protect all of that. Intellectual property, if you're doing something cutting edge, all right, um, and, you know, we think about the corporate espionage and you hear that that's basically a, an organization that will steal all of the information from a competing organization that's done all the R&D or the research and development, all right? This company spent decades or years building out, a, whether it be a service process or a device or a, a product, it's easier to steal it than it is to do your own R&D, all right? And if you don't have really good security, they can probably steal it maybe get it to market before you and uh, potentially disrupt your ability to keep your company, especially if that's your, you know, that's your key main product. And then other proprietary information, your corporate data, business partner information, uh, client data. Now remember the business partner information, if you have links and connections through portals to your other business partners, they will try to exploit those connections because you're kind of less, you're not coming in from the outside, you're coming from a trusted uh, connection. So that's another thing that you have to keep in mind, whether you're looking at bringing partners into your organization or if you're going out to their organization, you never want to have a connection that doesn't have a username or a password or some type of token to get into there. So top techniques, we talked about social engineering uh, and that's phone, that's in person. Phishing is a form of social engineering. It's making you, trying to make you believe that the email they sent is from a reputable individual and they're going to try to get you to click on a link or they're going to try to make you open, have you open up a document of some sort. Uh, and that's where these malware injecting devices like a PDF that's corrupted. If they get you to open a, P, uh, a corrupted PDF, it might be able to inject some type of malware into your organization. Missing security patches is a key thing. And I tell everybody, I'd say, and poor Amanda has heard this probably 50 times because we've done this so many times, is that there are two types of people, people who check their oil and people who don't check their oil, all right? If you regularly check your oil, the air in your tires, things like that, then you are the person that would most likely apply the security patches when you're asked to or when it's identified. Maybe not immediately, but you know what? You're fairly regular applying the patches. There might even be some sense of accomplishment because you did it, all right? Then there are the people who don't check their oil, don't check their tires. You know, they get in their car, they add gas, that's all they do. You're the ones that probably continually hit, no, don't do it now, don't do it later, whatever, I'm in the middle of something, I can't have shut down. Um, and those missing patches uh, add up over time. And those are, the ex those are the vulnerabilities that these individuals are trying to exploit. And you can run a scan on the entire internet and looking for one vulnerability and then just go after those machines anywhere in the world it's that one vulnerability maybe it was a patched several months ago you're looking for the people who don't patch and it doesn't take any effort basically you punch in the internet addresses and you hit enter and then you come back could be a day a week a month the beauty of a hacker is they have time all right they're never in a rush we're the ones that are in a rush because we're the ones that are trying to protect the information. Cracking passwords. We've all gotten notified, right? LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, T-Mobile. Those are some of the bigger ones there that we've had recently. What we they do is they use a method that we're talking about here, right? Some of the techniques. They get into an organization and one of the first things they go after is the password file. It's always in the same spot, right? That's just when they built it, right? Uh, when they built the... You know, operating systems, they put their password files in the same spot on all of the devices so hackers know where to go. And they go and they copy that password file and they take it and then they start trying to crack against it. They'll use dictionary attacks, they'll use uh, uh, applications that will try to break the algorithms. Now, it doesn't matter how um, strong the, 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 uh, the encryption is, if you're using a weak password, right? Sorry, let me go back on hit that by accident. Uh, it doesn't really matter because they, the way these applications work is they look to match it up. And once they find a match, they have at least one password. Now they're always looking for administrator passwords and root passwords because then you have the access to the entire organization. But if you just want to start, a user, a user account is enough to get into the network and kind of look around. 
and it defeats the first layer of defense. And then lastly here, open Wi-Fi. I'm a huge proponent of not using open Wi-Fi unless you're using your virtual private network. Open Wi-Fi is basically sending everything you are doing in clear text, and it's easily captured by individuals in those organizations in, in the surrounding areas. So if you're in an airport or if you're at a hotel or if you're at a Starbucks or a coffee shop or whatever, if they're using open Wi-Fi and you're using it without a virtual private network, you might as well just be a, speaking out loud your username and your password in the site that you're going to. Because that's basically what you're doing. You're just doing it in a digital format. And most people are like, okay, it's digital. It's just going through the air. They're Criminals can capture everything that's in the air. Um, and it's not hard, it's not expensive, it can be done. So basically they would be able to capture the, the site that you went to, the username, the password, they capture all the keystrokes of that. Uh, it's not difficult. So that's why I really encourage people, if you're gonna use open Wi-Fi, use a VPN. Now that is not your cellular technology. If you're doing banking on your cellular technology, that's different. That's secured. That one you don't necessarily need a VPN for, but if you're going to use open Wi-Fi, you definitely need a VPN. So let's understand your risk here. So the first thing is, is you know what? Cybersecurity is not rocket science. There's a lot of technologies that we use that are extremely um, hard to understand, all right? Highly technical, but the fundamentals of cybersecurity are very simple. And if you look at your network or your environment, like your house, if you can protect your house or protect your home and your family, you can protect your network. It's really basically the same thing. Look at your home as your network, all right? The address of your house is your website. So if someone types in your, your website, it takes you to your address of your house. Now, you could have a gate, uh, you could have a fence around your property, right? That's a layer. Uh, that could be, you know, a way to, you might have an alarm on that uh, fence. If someone comes through, it's an intrusion detection. But let's just say they get up to your front door, right? That front door is your firewall. We have a lock on the front door and we have a front door because we want to identify or determine who we want to enter our homes. If it's a stranger, we're going to try to vet that person to understand before we ever let them into our house. Someone knocks on the door and it's a friend, right? We let them in. If they're family, they have a key because we've, uh, you know, we validated them and we've gave, given them access so they know how to get into the house. But that firewall is the same way. You have rules in place to prevent or to authenticate only the individuals you want to enter your network. They have to have a reason to get in there and you're the ones that make that decision. But even if you have a friend come over, you have a party and you have friends come over, you may only want them in certain sections of your house, maybe the living room, the kitchen, the game room, whatever. Uh, but you don't want them upstairs. You don't want them in your kid's bedroom. You don't want them in your, your, your uh, master bedroom, right? That's segmentation. So when we allow someone, we don't just give them, it's not like a warehouse where we just let open the front door and they have access, like they go to Costco, right? We go to Costco, we can go find anything in Costco without walking through another door. The whole time, the entire building is wide open to us. That's what we would call a flat network. No segmentation whatsoever. But our houses do have segmentation because we have our master suite, right? And we have a door on there and we have a lock on there. So if we have a party, we can lock that door because there are valuables or assets in our bedroom that we don't want strangers to have access to. So we have that segmentation. That's what we do with our networks. We have individuals that can go to this application or can go to this file, but not everyone can go to that file. And then even further in that area, so if we have uh, uh, the finance department, right, which is the segmentation, look at that as the master suite, that's the finance. We only have several individuals that can go in there, accounts payable, accounts receivable, the director of finance, they can all go in there and they can access the assets for the finance department, just like you and your spouse can access the assets in your master bedroom. But there is even more uh, critical assets in the finance department that the, I, the director of I, or finance only wants himself or herself to have access to. They're the only ones that can authorize a payment. 
In your bedroom, you have that as assets too. You have uh, jewelry or cash or important documentation. You put that in a safe. And in that safe, you lock that, you know, you secure the safe and you have a combination lock. So even if uh, your children were in your bedroom, they can't get to those critical assets because you have another layer. Same thing with uh, the finance department. The finance department has a, a, an application or a file that only one or two people can get to. So that's even further segmentation where you're allowing authorization. So if you think about it, when we're trying to uh, figure out how we're going to protect our networks, kind of use your home and figure out, and, you know, just say, okay, does this make sense? You know, think of all of your, your windows and doors as you'll hear the term port. Right. Every application, every Internet service uses a port. There's 65,000 windows on a computer. OK, all of those have certain services assigned to them. Some would have none. All right. But that's your windows. Some windows we keep locked all the time. Some windows we keep open all the time. And some windows we don't lock, but we open and close them as needed. OK, so like a port 80 or is, uh, is your HTTP, your website. Uh, Port 443 or window 443 is how you do your secure transactions. That's your HTTPS. Okay. So that's a secure access. So all of those windows. So we have to make sure that we're, we know all of our windows. We know what's open. We know what's closed, all of that. So it's same concept with our network. So you can really normalize it. And like I said, not overcomplicated with all of these acronyms and numbers and you know, binary and hexadecimal. Let the geeks deal with that, all right? Just as long as you understand the fundamentals of security, you can explain it to either your IT person or your managed service provider, or even as, you know, if you're working with a cybersecurity professional, you can explain to them what is concerning you, what you want addressed. And it goes back to, like I said, what kind of house do you want to build, okay? Uh, you know, you, we all know the story of the three pigs, right? You can either build a straw house, it's quick, it's fast, but not very secure, or you can take a little time and build a house made out of uh, out of brick, which is a lot more secure. It's going to be able to stand. It's going to be far less apt to be uh, attacked by a hacker. Because remember, attackers are, or hackers and criminals are going to go the path of least resistance always. Okay, they don't want to raise uh, a red flag. They don't want to set off alarms. And this Christmas season is a perfect example. The malls are going to be back open, and you can walk into a parking garage and a criminal will almost bet you 100% of the time they're going to find a car that's not secure. So they're not going to smash a window and cause an impact. They're going to walk around. They're going to open and close, try to open every single door. And if they find an open door, that's the car they're going to steal from because it's unlocked. Maybe they don't get everything they want. But you know what? They're going to bank on the fact that they're get, they got something. OK, and then they're going to keep moving on. If they smash it, they're, they're, they might only get to two or three cars. Maybe there's 50 cars that are unlocked. They could basically criminalize 50 of those cars. But if they smash the first three windows, that it's done. They're not going to be able to. And they might not get anything if they smash the windows, too. So you think about how much time you want to spend. And it's not always resources. It's just a plan. All right. And when you're building your network, Think of Home and Garden Television, all right? The beauty of Home and Garden Television is that they inspire us, all right? We, we have our coffee on Saturday morning, we watch it, and we see someone completely demo and finish a bathroom in 30 minutes. And you know what? We're like, we can do this. It wasn't that difficult. So we run to Lowe's, Home Depot, we buy all the stuff, we tell our spouses that we're going to tear out the bathroom, we're going to fix it, because we've been wanting to do it for years, and we can do it far less cheaper than bringing in an expert. Or bringing in a professional, right? So we do it, we tear it out. Tear out's easy, demo's easy. Anything you demo is easy. But then five weeks later, our spouse is ready to take us to court because we ran into an issue, all right? Or work called, we had to travel or whatever, right? Life takes over. And five weeks later, we have an unusable bathroom. And then we end up having to call an expert because our spouse is ready to divorce us. So we call in the expert. It costs us more money because we messed up stuff and we demoed it. And we have all these tools and all these supplies. And now what do we do? I mean, so some things we can do on our own. 
all right? And, and I'm gonna share some of the things we can do. And then some things I recommend you at least speak to a professional before you go and demo your entire network because that network needs to be up to run your business, but it also needs to be secure. So here's just an example of like what the world was before COVID, right? It's just a traditional, actually, let me use this one here. Traditional network, you know, you've got your main office, a couple branch offices, firewalls, you know, maybe one or two people that would VPN in. It was great, all right? You know, we had a firewall here. So everybody behind these firewalls was protected. The data was protected. We had our firewall rules. And then March hits, right? And we all have to send everybody home. What do we do? This is what we do. We send everybody home with their laptops, with their desktops, with their own personal device. And now instead of three branch offices, we've got like 15 branch offices. And a lot of these branch offices and the branch offices that we have are empty. So we're not doing any transactions. Nobody's here. Nobody's here. They're all home now. All right. And now they've got to get to these servers. How do they do that? They connect to the internet. They connect through their own routers. They get on the internet. We give them the ability to connect for not using VPNs. We give them RDP or remote desktop protocols, which is, allows them to access all of this. And we're doing it all insecure. We don't know who's on their laptops. Maybe, you know, uh, at the end of the day, they let their kids play on the laptops, you know, because now I've got an extra device at home. That's great. Now I have, well, instead of one, now I have two. Uh, and I'm not working, so why can't my kids use it? Or maybe I'm surfing the internet, on, you know, and I'm doing it all in, in an unprotected environment because I don't have a firewall at my house. Uh, I'm connecting all uh, open, open light. It was just chaos, right? But you know, all of that information is still going across the internet. And that's why we had to create these, we had to pivot, we had to find ways to do this. And we're still dealing with this because a lot of organizations have made the determination that maybe they have a hybrid environment. People come back only a couple of days a week. Maybe people will never come back. Maybe some will never come back. So, you know, we're all adapting, but regardless of where these people are sitting, the company's responsible for the protection of that data. So we have to make sure that we give our employees the right tools to protect our data. And there, you know, sometimes people ask, what's a VPN? VPN basically creates a point-to-point -point connection that can't be captured or sniffed. You'll hear those terms a lot. But down the bottom here, you can see that all of this is unencrypted. So you, know, you send a request, it goes out to the internet, comes back right right back to you um, with a uh, with no VPN you can see it just goes out comes back all the you know your passwords your usernames your sites all that stuff is, is easily captured by these individuals that are on, on the internet when you connect to a VPN the moment you open the application everything you type is encrypted inside this tunnel Right? So no one can get through the tunnel. All right, you add in, it connects with a server of some sort, whether it's at your organization or if it's a commercial server like NordVPN or Norton's VPN. And then that sends the request out to the internet. And when the internet comes back, it comes back to this address. So they don't know it's you. They do, and they can't detect what you're transmitting because all of that data is encrypted. So, it, and so there's a couple of things. One is the VPN server protects our identity and our location, but it also protects all of the data that we're sending back and forth. So now all of that data is encrypted. So even if someone was to capture the data stream, they wouldn't be able to decrypt it because it's just a bunch of encrypted data. It's all, it's unreadable and they can't decrypt that data. So we also talked about passwords. Um, like I said, we've been using passwords for 30 years. This is the top 20 most popular stolen passwords after 30 years. You'd think we'd be doing a little bit better. Now, you, some of you might be laughing, like, really, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6? The only reason someone uses 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 is because the organization allows them to use 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. But as I've said, if you allow four to 12, they're going to use four characters. If you're going to say 
we allow you to use uh, alphanumeric with uh, a special character, but we don't enforce it, they're going to use the least possible because people don't like remembering passwords, especially if you're going to make them change it every 90 days. Okay. So these are the ones, you know, when we have these encryption or these uh, passwords stolen from larger companies and they end up on the dark web, we get to see what it is, right? And you can see um, it's really all about easily remembered uh, passwords. Now, some of these people, if you allow it, might be using this to get access into your organization. That should cause you some little concern. Uh, if you allow that or if you don't manage it, then people are going to use the least. It's just like everything else, right? The least possible route, the, the quickest way to get to something. People aren't going to create uh, difficult passwords if they don't have to. And when I talked about that, you know, if you think about this, all right, even an eight character password with alphanumeric, an upper and lowercase number, and a, and a special character will take 57 days for me to crack it using the password cracking software that I have. Now, 57 days, you're like, oh, 57 days. But remember, I told you, it might take them six months to figure out they have uh, a breach. So that 57 days comes and goes. That's why, at a minimum, if you're not regulated, I tell people to use a nine-character password. Because if you use a nine-character password with the same requirements, it goes from 57 days to 12 years. Because we start talking about the number of permutations or possible passwords. I'm okay with 12 years, all right? Because that's enough time for you to be notified that there was a password breach with this provider. You can go in, you can change it. And then if you're using multi-factor authentication, you even have an, an extra layer of comfort. Um, if you are a government contractor and you're gonna be doing with the business, business with the government, they now have their new cybersecurity maturity model where they're making it 12 characters with complexity. So what they're saying is they feel comfortable that 5 million years is enough time for them to feel comfortable that someone's not going to crack your password. That's using a laptop. Okay, please don't text me. What about quantum computing and all that stuff? That's, if you have more CPU power, you can make some of these applications work faster, all right? But right now, quantum computing is not really economical for most organizations, unless, like I said, maybe state-sponsored, but most criminals, they don't need it. And the reason is, is I only need one password to start. And from there, so if I have someone who has a six character password, right, it's going to take me 13 minutes to get into that account. I can use that and then I can go in from there and, and, and search. And maybe, and while I'm doing that, I'm still running uh, my password cracker. Okay. So maybe 57 days later, I get the admin's password and then, then I'm, I'm done. I don't, I, I don't need to run it anymore because I got into the organization with the level of, of, of a level of rights that I want and I can go anywhere I want from there. So I have that master key. I go anywhere in that house that I want to. Nothing's going to restrict me because I have the admin or root password. So we're like, all right, all you've done is made me realize I don't want to be on the internet. Uh, or I, what am I going to do? I'm, I'm just a solopreneur. Or I only have three people, right? How am I going to do this? The beauty is, is that a lot of this stuff that we're going to talk about next is actually free or extremely low cost. And what that does is it just, it makes you less of a target. So I'm going to leave you guys with five steps that you can take today and five steps that you can take tomorrow. Now, this presentation is going to be PDF. It's going to be sent out to everybody. So you don't have to like, you know, write down notes as quickly as you need to. You'll get a copy of it. You can go through it. So the first thing I tell everybody is get some professional help. All right. Where, and because the SBDC offers no cost cybersecurity consultation, um, I would highly recommend you reach out to them and talk to one of us. All right. Help us understand what your environment is, what you're protecting and just, we can help you prioritize what's the first things you do. And like I said, don't do it yourself, all right? Because if your expertise is a medical doctor or a dentist or an insurance agent, right? 
I have all of those. I have a doctor, a dentist, an insurance agent. I do not try to self-medicate. I don't try to go buy, you know, all of those cool dental tools and try to, you know, take care of my teeth every six months. I go to a professional for a reason. They understand what they're doing. They can do it in far less time than I can do it and at far less cost. Inventory your assets. You don't need an expert to do that. You count your computers. You count your, um, you know, you count your computers, count your phones, count your servers, your access points, your information. You can do that yourself. You need to know what you have connected to your network in order to be able to protect it. Backing up, all right? I tell everybody all the time, if you're not going to back up, don't do anything on military, right? Because even if cybersecurity was not an issue, your digital data is sitting on a device with moving parts. That device is going to fail. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of just when. And so much so that if you've ever bought a hard drive and you actually read the documentation, they use a term called uh, MTBF, which is mean time between failures. Manufacturers have an average of how long your device is going to last. All right. So you want to make sure you're backing up. Three, two, two. Minimum, if it's important, back it up three times. Back it up on two different types of media, like an external hard drive, an offsite. And then at least two of those need to be offsite, you know, at your house or online, whatever, uh, you know, carbonite, whatever like that, because you can't guarantee that your backups are always going to work. Uh, you install a firewall. We talked about why you need a firewall. A router at home is not enough. A router from Comcast or Xfinity, no matter what they tell you, is not enough. It needs to have a firewall of some sort. Encrypting your devices, all right? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Uh, encryption comes native with your operating system, okay? Backup comes native with your operating system. You just have to buy the external drive. I bought a five terabyte drive for like $95 from Costco. Uh, it's so cheap that you can buy that and you can back up everything you own to that drive. Same thing with encryption, it comes with your operating system. You can do that, very simple. It's just a couple of clicks and your device is encrypted. So therefore, if someone steals your device, they just have a device. You've lost a $800,000 device, but you didn't lose 500 or 5,000 clients with PII or PHI. You no longer have a data breach. You have a lost device. Upgrades. Like I said, if you like doing upgrades, do it. If not, you can go on inside Microsoft, Apple, whatever, and just click and say, update me as necessary. Uh, training your employees. Very important, all right? And low cost. Now, showing your employee a 30 minute video once a year is not going to make that employee, turn that employee from a liability to an asset. It's no different than if you eat one salad a year, you are not eating a healthy lifestyle, right? You ate one salad, congratulations, but you're not healthy. Uh, and same thing goes with security awareness and security training. You need to make it repetitive, uh, make it as enjoyable as possible, uh, do phishing tests. You want to make it get, get it into their mind that they want to be security aware because it impacts their job, it impacts their livelihood if you have to go out of business. Physical access, that goes without saying, if I can get to it, I own it. I don't care what kind of logical controls you have on, all I need is physical access to any device and me or any qualified individual is going to be able to get access to that data. Same thing with employees don't need access to everything. They just need enough to do their jobs. OK, uh, so you want to make sure that you keep it to what they need to do their jobs effectively, but not everyone needs global administrator rights. And lastly, strong passwords and where possible, use that multi-factor authentication. Uh, remember, multi-passwords or authentication, like I said, is, is uh, something you know is a password, something you have is a token of some sort, and who you are, and that's where you have biometrics. Those are the only three ways to remotely identify an individual on the internet. The best way is to use at least two of the three. So even if someone steals your password, they don't have that second factor, so it gives you time. And in the end, like I tell everybody, you don't have to outrun the bear as long as you can outrun your friend, all right? So, and same thing with cybercrime, you don't have to be a hundred percent secure you just have to be more secure than the next person who's not doing anything if you do just a little if you do those 10 things that we just talked about you have raised yourself far enough out of the way that 
they're not going to find you easily because there's so many other people that aren't doing it. They're going to be the victims. And it's not what I want, but you know what? I can't fix everybody. I can only fix the people that I can work with. And you guys are the ones that are going to take this information. And if you implement it, it makes you far less attractive to a criminal because you are more effort than somebody else who's not doing it. So here's some of the contact information. You know, uh, the Virginia SBDC, if you want to set up a meeting, you can uh, use help at virginiasbdc.org. You can email me directly. Um, we do do our, our Facebook Lives every Tuesday at 12.30 where we pick a topic and we try to normalize it. You know, you hear the term intrusion prevention system. What does that mean? I'll normalize it. Or we'll talk about a breach or we'll talk about a, a certain you know, something that's more technical, we take a few minutes, just try to normalize it so that you have an understanding so you can kind of talk intelligently to it without actually knowing all of the specifics. So we do that every Tuesday. We've got a year's worth um, all online. Uh, so you can find all the links either at uh, uh, the Virginia SBDC uh, on, my face, on my Facebook page. If you just follow the Virginia SBDC, you'll get notified when we're on as well as, you know, you'll have that link to go look at it at a later time. Or you can go to my website Website, I link to all of those SBDC ones as well. And then lastly, I just got a couple of uh, links with some resources if you're interested in getting a little more information about the things that we've talked about. And now we've got a few minutes. Um, Amanda, if we have any questions, um, we can go through them now. Yeah, we have a few. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, I'm going to start. So if you have questions, the QA box is the best place to put them. Um, this first one, I think. I might need some clarification, but I would like to know if there's a place to learn how to do a test email for our current employees. I'm guessing maybe a phishing email test. Uh, we don't have an IT department to develop one. Is this something I can find more info how to do online? Are you talking about a phishing email test maybe? Yeah, so there's a company called Know Before. It's K-N-O-W-B-E number four. Um, and they are a security awareness company. They but they offer a lot of free tools uh, for organizations, uh, for smaller organizations. So I would start there. Uh, I think they actually have a phishing uh, tool that you can download. But if you if they don't, I think I've used it in the past, but there's a couple of great security awareness companies that offer uh, free tools. The only thing is, you know, when you register for it, you might get a phone call from somebody who wants to talk to you about it, but you can just tell them no. Uh, but really, the, they have a lot of great do that. I've used their phishing uh, examples in some of the training that I've done, so it's a great place to start. Yes. Okay. Also, I, I've also found um, we're gathering some resources to put on our um, cybersecurity webpage on the Virginia SBDC page. And the Delaware SBDC has this tool. Um, I'm going to put the link in the chat. It's a phishing. If you want to sign up for phishing emails, um, like to not to sign up for real ones, but ones to test, um, I signed up for it. So I haven't gotten one yet that I know of. So we'll see. But that's, um, that's another one too that I found. Um, now we have another one. Well, this one's kind of maybe a, um, let's go, um, which services do you recommend for internet protection? Uh, so I'm not sure what the internet protection means, but, um, if you're, if you're talking about firewalls, I would, uh, I would look at companies like Fortinet. I would look at, uh, there's Ubiquity. There is also uh, Cisco Meraki, it's M-E-R-A-K-I, uh, and SonicWall. All four of them provide what we call a SOHO or small office, home office firewalls, perfectly sufficient. I think they run anywhere from like about 150 to probably maybe $350 uh, for the device. But they also come with um, combined packages where they'll provide additional malware, antivirus, uh, a whole bunch of other slew of services. So it's really, overall, it's inexpensive. If you have an office, I would any four of those would be great. Uh, you kind of just have to look at the features and, uh, and the costs. But for, like I said, $150, I mean, the most some of the most popular routers at Best Buy are like $280 just for the router. So it's really not a significant cost. And the value that you get 
for that and the comfort. Uh, and a lot of them also come with VPN access. So uh, it, it, you can build that into your package. So I would look at that from an internet protection perspective. All right, thank you for that. Um, should all business owners implement two-step authentication for each software app they're using? And do you have any app recommendations? I think it's about the two-factor two authentication. So a lot of two-factor authentication is um, built into some of these applications and they do it for free. So they'll either do it through the Microsoft, uh, you know, Facebook has their code generator, um, and companies like Amazon, they'll use uh, Google Auth, there's Microsoft Auth, a lot of uh, applications will tie it into. So things like LinkedIn, Amazon, they all use that for free. Um, I would leverage those if you, if you can, uh, but if you're looking for something Specific, a lot of the firewalls also offer uh, multi-factor authentication, either a software token that uh, like there's duo security uh, that can be tied to a firewall. Fortinet does a lot of that too, where it's an application that they put on their phone or their desktop and like, you know, they log in and then they have to generate that six digit code to uh, as, a, as a multiple factor. So a lot of the firewalls build two-factor authentication right into it. Because as a small business owner, you don't want to buy a bunch of different applications. You really kind of hope that you can get uh, a suite from a reputable organization. But yes, if you can use two-factor authentication, I would highly recommend you use it. Great. Thank you. And the next question I am going to answer, I'm going to put some things in the chat here. Um, so do we need to join the Facebook group to join the Cybersecurity Facebook Live? No, you can uh, follow the Virginia SBDC on Facebook and you'll get notifications when we go live, but it's every Tuesday on that on the Facebook page at 1230, but the recordings are all saved. Um, I think Tom mentioned earlier, maybe in another one, we have a year's worth of these kind of webinars recorded on our Facebook page, so you can go find them over there. Um, today, we're going to send out the slides from the presentation and the recording um, over an email within the next day or two, we'll get it out to you. Um, and if you need one-on-one -on -one counseling in the, in, if you're in Virginia, you can email help at virginiasbdc.org. Um, if you're in the Virgin Islands, info at visbdc.org um, to get counseling or questions. Um, for future webinars or accessing our past webinars, you can always go to um, the Virgin Islands SBDC is visbdc.org slash workshops, and you can sign up for their upcoming workshops and see past ones. For Virginia SBDC, it's virginiasbdc.org slash training. Um, so you'll be able to see this one eventually will be up on um, the web page and you'll be able to access it, but you also get an email. Um, and that is that. Um, so I saw what is a token? Yeah. Um, a yeah. token is something that you have. So if you've ever logged into a credit card, your bank, and they send you a six digit code to, uh, to uh, via text, that phone is identified as a token. Um, in the old days, it used to be a little token that you with a six digit code that would change every 30 seconds, like an RSA token, or they have software tokens like that you can put on your phone and we open it up like the code generator for Facebook. Uh, it changes. So that's a token is just something that you have that only you should have. Like you would be the only person holding your phone. So when you got that text with the six digit code, the sender is fairly confident that it is you who would read that and then enter it after one of the logins. So that's really just what a token is. I have one from the chat earlier in the chat. Do online, and this might've been in context of something you were talking about. Do online stores like Shopify, PayPal, or Wix have these securities in place? I'm thinking it was talking about maybe some kind of website security or something. I don't know the question. So most e-commerce, We'll have, now, Wix is a, uh, is a tool to create a website. That's all Wix does. It's like WordPress, all right? So they don't, uh, they offer security, but they don't implement the security. The person building the web page has to implement the security. But yes, like Shopify, Amazon, any reputable uh, e-commerce site will have, uh, first of all, the HTTPS. So when you go to a site and you see HTTPS, you have to see that before you enter in uh, your your 
user or your name and your credit card information because then at least that transaction is encrypted. Don't buy anything from a site that does not use HTTPS because everything then is unencrypted. Um, but yeah, the larger ones all have that in place. And like I said, Amazon uses two-factor authentication. A lot of other e-commerce sites offer two-factor authentication. So when you do log in, especially if you shop regularly there, uh, that's just another way for them to validate that it's actually you and someone hasn't stolen your account information and is shopping um, and is shopping with your account. But yes, just the, most of them, and then a lot of them put it down the bottom uh, in the privacy section, they'll talk about that they go through regular checks or that their provider is hosting, has certain firewalls, capabilities. So you can do a little more research. Uh, most, like I said, most uh, reputable e-commerce sites are putting in a lot of the security. Great, thanks. Um, I have another question. Do the built-in firewalls and programs like Bitdefender work well for micro home-based businesses? So Bitdefender firewalls only work on your endpoint. So it's like your antivirus. Your antivirus works on your endpoint, but you also have to have antivirus on your server or another device that you may use for your work. It's, it's uniquely to the endpoint. So they do work, uh, but they only protect that one device. If you have multiple devices, you'd have to have the, the Bitdefender firewall active on every single device, which I recommend that you have, even if you have another firewall, uh, even if you have a hardware firewall, because then that uh, provides another layer of security for your for yourself. Great. And is that it? Um I one more just popped in. Hmm. This is kind of more related to Facebook questions. So um hmm. this is about securing Facebook page. That would be Facebook's job. They, yeah. they security, right. So Facebook yeah. Do the security for you for that. I open uh I opened a Facebook yesterday afternoon so I could set up my company page, but noticed this morning an email from Facebook that said my email address changed the timestamp that was about four hours after I set up the Facebook account. Is there a way to secure? I'm um, I think that might be a Facebook question. Yeah, you'd have to check with Facebook uh, on that. All right, um, and then I have one last one. I think it's kind of a, going back to your password. I mean, this your password list of the most commonly stolen passwords. And this person wants to know how how come Aaron four thirty one is one of the most stolen passwords. I don't make the list. I just share the list. <laughs> um, I have no idea why Aaron four thirty one. The only thing I can think of is that uh, uh, A A Ron, uh, you know, uh, skit. From oh. Chappelle, the Chappelle skit. That's all I can think of is AA, okay. but I can't think of any way why 431 was there. Uh, sorry, I don't know, but I like I said, I don't make it either. It's just ones that come up and they change too, they vary. Okay, I think. Yeah, we're a little we're a little over now. I think it's time to wrap up. Um, thank you, everybody, so much for your questions today. And like I mentioned before, you're going to receive an email uh, with a link to the recording and evaluation, which we already kind of did today, um, and to the slides. If you'd like to sign up for upcoming webinars or access recorded webinars, like I said, please visit virginiasbdc.org/training. And for Virgin Islands SBDC, visbdc.org/workshops. And I think that's it. Um, do we have anything else to add from the Virgin Islands today? I think that's good. Excellent. Well, thank you, everybody, for attending. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll be doing a lot more of these. So we look forward to hopefully seeing you guys in the future. Thank you very much for today. Okay. Thanks. All right. Bye, everybody.